Last week, we talked a little bit about the body, soul, and the spirit. We talked about a little how, what it meant to be born again, that how because of Adam's sin, Jesus, God, God said that you shall surely die. When you sin, you shall surely die. And we noticed that he didn't die physically. When Adam sinned, he died spiritually. The, his spirit that was meant to house God and be able to flow through and show the world around him the goodness of God died so he wasn't able to receive those spiritual things. And he began to be led solely by his soul, his emotions and whatever he was dealing with in life. To be born again means that the, you accept the penalty paid for our sins. At that point in time, the Holy Spirit of God come lives within my spirit and I, my spirit becomes born again. It's, a, it's alive again to the things of God. And we talked last week about the challenges then is this. The challenge is, is allowing the Holy Spirit to come through us. And so many times the Holy Spirit can't come through us like he needs to because he's got to come through our soul. So for the Holy Spirit to be able to do a work in our life or do our work to, to the lives of people around us, he's got to come through our soul. The difficulty with our soul is this. Our soul is a, is a product of my family raising. It's a product to the worldly standards around me. It's just a product of a lot of that stuff. And, and, and so we've gained, grown accustomed to a tr trusting in our soul more than we have the Spirit of God. And we talked a little bit last week of how we're able to do that, allow the Spirit of God uh, to flow through us and work through us in our lives. So uh, those generations of beliefs, those, by the way, is there any reason why those spotlights need to be on me in the back? Yeah, but that's killing me. Just bring them down a little bit, can you? I can't even see Brother Rayford smiling on me. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, so we learn a little bit about that, how generational beliefs. And by the way, if you ever want to study, go study what they call cellular DNA. Cellular DNA says this. Not only do we care the memories that we've learned in our life, we care the memories of our forefathers. That's deep. That's deep. And we know a little bit about that because he said the, uh, the, we, the, the sins of the father were passed to the third and fourth generation. So we see that. So it's imperative for us to get into the word of God. That way all those belief systems and stuff, we can say, no, 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 no. We want the spirit of God to come through us. Amen. And today I want to talk a little bit. About, I thought I was going to get the song. How many know the song, Walk It Out? I, w I went to YouTube and watched Walk It Out. The Walk It Out was part two until them girls started doing the... I said, well, we may not ought to do walk it out at Hosanna today. They started doing some pop, lock, and drop. And I said, nah, we'll just, we'll stick with the title, walk it out, all right? And so we want to talk a little bit today about allowing the Holy Spirit flow through us so we can walk out everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title today is Walk It Out, all right? Let's walk out everything that God has done for us. Amen. So that don't mean you go home and watch that ungodly song. I only watched the first clip and the rest of it I had to turn it off. All right? So we learn to walk it out. Amen. Anytime you look at the Bible, mainly Bible, the uh, part of the Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote. Paul, Paul was a legal scholar. Paul was a uh, uh, Pharisee of Pharisees. He sit under, it'd be like you sitting under the most scholarly person in the world. You've been able to sit under his feet and him discipling you to become, the, become great when it comes to knowledge of the scripture. Paul was one of those people. He was able, he sit under the feet of what, a person by the name of Gamaliel who was just like, again, the top ranked person when it comes to uh, understanding scripture. So when he approaches a passage, he always gives you a, a legal basis for your beliefs. In other words, he gives you a, what, something that you can stand on even though you're not seeing it in your life in particular. It's what we call positional truths. We're going to look at the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, the first three chapters, God is laying some things, facts that he laid down. Things that he sees whether you see it in your life or not. 
It's things that he declared, and when he declared it, whether it's manifesting in our lives in particular at the moment does not matter. What matters is, is do we believe the facts that he lays out? So we got what you call positional truths, and then we got what our state or condition truths. So position and condition. Positions are things that God's word says about us. Conditions is what we feel about ourselves and what the world is seeing. Okay? And it's imperative, you know, let me read it this way. This is a statement I got. Another way to say this is the difference between how God sees me in this world as his own, in this world as his own, as opposed to how I and those around me see in what I am experienced. In other words, it's truth versus feelings, okay? Truth, what God's word declares based upon what I may presently feelings. We got too many people walking by feelings rather than five, by, in faith in Christ Jesus. So, number one, what is our position in Christ? He did, talks about it in the first three chapters. If you're a born again child of God, I do not care how you feel. I care if you believe the truth of God's word. The truth of God's word is the only thing we can look towards in this crazy world that we live in. It is the only truth that I can look at and help me because things change. I mean, things change throughout the years, all right? So the truth of God's word tells us certain things and we want to learn about it in Christ's name. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. The first three, while you're turning there, the first three chapters are doctrinal statements or facts or teachings or things that God is wanting to say to you to let you know. Then you can walk these things out. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, everybody say, but God. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love. Everybody say his great love. See, it ain't my great love. It's not your great love. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. Has made us alive together with Christ. Now notice the word alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many of y'all feel like y'all sitting in heavenly places right now with Jesus? But the Word of God tells us that we are. So if the Word of God says we are already in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then we need to try to figure out what it means because I feel like I'm on earth. I got me some new kickers here and they kind of ain't broke in yet so my feet are hurting a little bit. I feel like I'm on earth right now and not in heavenly places but God's word declares that I am there with him. So what is it meaning there? First of all, it says we are alive together in Christ. In God's mind, because he's not limited to time, God is in the past, he's in the present, but he's also in the future. In God's mind, he already declares and see you with him seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's not worried about what you're doing or not doing. He already sees what's going on in his mind. So when God sees you, what does he see? He sees his son, Jesus Christ, because we're sitting together with him in heaven. Let's keep on going a little bit, okay? And has raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Look what he says there, in Christ. Are you in Christ today? If we are in Christ, a born again child of God, and you are in Christ, you are already there. So that is why God can declare, I am this for you because he already sees it accomplished in your life. Now, how am I going to work or walk out everything that God has bought for me or done for me or paid the price for me? Let's look at it. Sit, he's looking at, in other words, you're, he says here, you're seated together with him in heavenly places. Right now, you are all sitting in a chair. 
If you were standing up, that means you would be working. You would be walking around, working to do certain things. In other words, it would take effort for you. It takes effort for me to pick this leg up and move forward, this leg up and move forward. In other words, this is something that I'm having to do for myself. And he says, when it comes to your first doctrinal truth is this right here. We are seated with God in heavenly places. It is not about me trying to work to get something God has already given for me, because guess what? I'm sitting. So I'm sitting means I am resting. If you're going to be able to walk out everything that God has done for you, it is imperative that you understand, first of all, it must be a, from a position of rest. If I'm going to walk out and do something, I must learn to do it by the Spirit of God, by the person of Christ, because I'm united with Him. And if I attempt to step out and do something on my own, I'm doing it in my own effort. And what i got to learn to do is allow the Holy Spirit quickened in me God's truth, even though I may be feeling the opposite in my heart and mind. I don't live my life based upon what I feel. I live my life, by the way, it's great to see you there, sweet. I see you there, great, awesome. If I, I don't live by what I feel. I live by what the Word of God tells me. Y'all get it? So if I'm going to begin to live this Christian life, I must do it from a place of rest. Well, what is this? I cease from my own effort and enter into his efforts that's with me. Now hang on with me right quick. Sit, sit, if you look at the first three chapters, he talks about redemption through his blood. Not yours, redemption through his blood. Salvation through what? Faith in Christ Jesus. I believe in what he done. He talks about peace. See, look at me. We can have peace in the midst of the craziness that's going on around us when we learn to recognize that God has got my back even though he is sovereign and I have a will. God is trying to work things out for my good so I can have peace in the midst of the storm and I can learn to kick back and rest instead of trying to figure out how to make all this work on my own. Half of us got in the trouble that we are in right now because we've been trying to figure it out on our own and it has caught up with us. You see what I'm saying? So we've got to learn to sit back and learn to rest in what God's done. See, his peace is something he gives us. It's his peace. It's not us doing something to have peace. It's his peace. It's his promises. The promises are yes and amen to those who believe. So everything we do must become a positional truth. This is something that I believe. It doesn't matter how I feel. I'm not going to walk by how I feel. I'm going to walk according to what God's word says. It's his peace. It's his redemption. It's his access. He provides access to him in his presence. It is imperative. I want you all to get this. Some of you Pentecostals, I want you to get this. For too many years, we were begging and telling God to come, and he's here. We're begging God to give us something. He said, man, I've already died for you to have it. And we're doing all this, and God says, look, if you want to receive from me, it will not be from a position of walking it out, It will be, or a position of works. It will be from a position of me resting in what Jesus Christ has already accomplished. If you can't get that part, if you don't get that part, then you can't get the rest of it. You hear me? It's not about what I do. It's about what has already been done. It is imperative that you understand the positional truths first. Only then can we tra transition into our walk or transition into walking out what God has already done. Y'all get it? It's a place of rest. See, rest has been given to us and rest is required for us to be able to receive the promises of God. What do you mean? I have heard people beg, kick walls, fast, go without food for six weeks, all to get something that Jesus has already died for us to receive. God's like, you're just doing without food, dude, because I'm not going to operate based upon you doing without food. I'm going to operate based upon your faith and what I've accomplished. So God's word is point blank telling us if you're going to do stuff, it's going to come from a positional truth 
Rest is given, rest is required. Ephesians 4, 1 through 4 says it like this. Remember, positional truths were the first three chapters. That's what Paul is laying out facts about things. Now he positions over to what do we do with those facts? Ephesians 4, verse 1 says, I therefore. Anytime you see therefore, for, you got to go see what it's there for. We've already talked about what it's there for. Positional truths. He said, if you can understand these positional truths, therefore, this is what's going to begin to happen. Now, I want you to get this. If you're here just because it's Sunday, you're in the wrong place. I'm coming at you with both barrels. I want you to get this. Okay? I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. In other words, he's begging you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So we first talked about, we first, first, let me see, I don't remember exactly how I worded that. The first one is what is our position in Christ? Number two is what is our life in the world? How do we live this life in the world? The word walk there, now y'all get this. Please get this. The word walk we means I regulate my behavior because the Spirit of God's in me. I can now regulate my behavior based upon the Spirit of God's within me. I do not have to act a fool. I can regulate myself. I now have the ability by the Spirit of God in me, if I'll trust that he's at peace with me, if I'll trust that he's working it all out for me, if I'll trust that I'm justified in his faith, even though in his faith, I may not be justified in your eyes, but I am in his eyes. If I can trust in all of these things, guess what? I can begin to order my behavior to act like God's word says rather than what I'm doing in Jesus' name, look at us here. Just as Jesus was the express image of God, so we are invited to do the same. You understand that? The way Jesus walked and the way Jesus treated people, even when they spit on him, they called him a liar. He said, John the Baptist come neither eating and drinking and y'all called him crazy. I come eating and drinking, sitting with sinners and y'all call me a wine bibber. Look at me. Y'all need to get your mind straight. What God, what Jesus was saying, if you want to see what God is like, look at the way Jesus treated and loved people. And if people in this world is going to see what God is like, the only way that he will ever, people will ever see what God is like is how? Through you. Do you get that? The only way people will be able to know who God is loved is when you love them. The world is in the shape that it is, is because the church has not been expressing Jesus to them. They've been expressing their own opinions. They've been expressing their own beliefs. They've watched too much YouTube about certain things and then they spout it off instead of looking at the word of God and seeing what the word of God says about a situation. And so God is saying here, look, when it comes to the things of the kingdom, you start out in rest and then you begin to order your behavior based upon what the scripture says. Now listen, if the invitation for you has been set, then everything needed to accomplish that invitation has been given. That's what the word calling is. Walk out, your, walk, walk worthy of your calling. The word calling means an invitation. Look, when I, when I seen this, I was like, oh, yeah, baby. The word means a call, an invitation to a feast. What does it mean, a feast? To abundant life. God has given us the invitation to have abundant life based upon what he has accomplished and he's called us out in the midst of this world to walk it out. He's got a feast set before you. Young people, your problem is, listen to me, you're feasting on what the world says is cool. You're feasting on what the world says is popular. Take it from a bald, fat, old preacher. Done been there, done that, done chased it all, and it got me nowhere. Glory to God, at the age of 19, I recognized it. I hope you get that while you're young and not when you're older like us. So you're out there working it out, trying to get approval. 
based upon what you do and say. And guess what? God says, I got an approval for you that's in here. That way, if you dressed all up this morning, it's all good. But if you've been in work clothes, it's still all good. It's still all good. Listen right here. God wants to give you increase in your life. You hear me? He wants to give you increase. You're dogging on yourself for something you did 20 years ago. It's time to let that thing go. Those mindsets about let it go. God don't want to bless you because of your effort. He wants to bless you because of his son. Now, y'all hang on with me. Now, let's keep on. While. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 21. That God... That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, this is what Paul is praying, and this is what I pray for you. I got a prayer of all the uh, nine prayers of Paul. I got them hanging on my wall, and this is what I pray for you all. But look what he says, because this is what Paul prayed. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. The word being enlightened means it's where we get the word photograph. God wants to give you a photograph and some repeated photo, uh, photographs of everything that he's accomplished. We need to pray every day. God, I used to pray, Lord, I, I, didn't, you know, I didn't do real good in high school. In fact, I wasted a lot of years. But God, if you'll give me the wisdom and the understanding, I'll share it with people. Ain't that what Solomon prayed? Give me wisdom to run this great nation. I don't ask for myself. I ask for wisdom to know how to handle what's going to come my way. And he, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what the hope of who's calling. Who's calling? His. It's his calling. What is he calling you new? That you may know the hope of his calling, which is all the riches of the glory of his inheritance in who? And let's stop right there and let's talk about that a little bit. God wants to give you a snapshot of who you are. He wants you to know as you walk in your calling, he becomes rich. How can God become rich? The word rich there means really almost like famous. As a born again child of God, as I do the things of the kingdom, and I show love, people say, there's something different about that person. And they know we're Christians. Who are we bringing glory to? As a born again child of God, when we forgive, who are we giving glory to? God. As a born again child of God, as we're blessed and as we become generous to other people, who are we giving glory to? See, when we begin to walk out, order our behavior based upon what the scripture says, all we're doing is making God rich. We're making him famous. I want to make him famous in everything that I do. He wants to give you a snapshot of everything that God has done for you where in turn you can begin to order your behavior in that way and you can begin to do these things. That way everybody say, he is a good God. Because in Mississippi, all they know him is a bad God. When I say bad, as a God that'll strike you down if you don't do right. He's a God sitting up in heaven mad at the world and ready to zip you and zap you when you don't do everything right. That's how people see it. And they take the Old Testament to prove it. Well, the Old Testament was nothing but a group of people, the Israelites, who said, God, we don't want you to be a part of our life. Just give us a bunch of rules. And God said, okay, you want a bunch of rules? I'm going to give you a bunch of rules. You can't do it, but you asked for it, so here it is. I'm going to give you a bunch of rules. And based upon your keeping of the rules, you'll be blessed. And when you don't do the rules, you'll be cursed. You wanted a standard. God says, here you go, you bunch of rebellious people. So in the Old Testament, when everything was going good in their life, blessings come and then but when everything started going bad guess what the nations of the earth begin to curse him the good news is in the new testament jesus christ has become that 
uh, that, that, that person for you that he's not given cursings or blessings based upon your performance. He's given you uh, blessings based upon your faith in what Jesus Christ has accomplished. Now, if you go out there and do something stupid, God says, well, you didn't have faith. You trusted in yourself. So this is what's going to happen. But he ain't taking it away from you. We ourselves are taking it from us. Now, hang on with us. I read a book years ago. This book was called Turkeys or Eagles. And it was a story about a turkey whose egg fell out and fell into a turkey nest. And when he come out, he was raised, but all the time coming up as a little chicklet or whatever, eaglet or whatever, he had always looked at them other people and said, man, I just don't look like them. And he'd look up into the sky and he'd say, man, I just long to be up there. And so he's just pecking around, bottom feeder, just pecking around. Older he got, he goes, man, my feathers are even different from theirs. I, I just long to be something else. He began to learn them bunch of turkeys. I'm an eagle. I've been pecking around acting like a turkey. And God has given me wings to fly above the storms of life. And that is what some of us are today. You eating turkey food, baby. And God wants to give you the ability to fly above the storms of life. And you down here with the world just being a turkey. And God wants you to learn to live like an eagle. You know what an eagle does? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They will run and grow, not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know what? The eagle is the only bird that does what? He gets new feathers on. He can replenish his feathers, his eyesight. Everything changes. And you are living like a turkey. Some of you are. Now, I know some of y'all rednecks like turkeys. See, he wants you to know that as you live the eagle life, as you live the life that he's called you to live, given you an invitation to live, you bring glory to him. What are we giving the world around us? What do they see in you? Well, if that's what your God's like, I don't want to have no part of it. Verse 18 back in uh, Ephesians, uh, yeah, Ephesians 4, I think it is. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding, that'd be two, wouldn't it? Chapter 1, got me. The eyes of your understanding being lightened that you may know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You something special. The only way he can get out what he's done from the very beginning. Well, I tell you what, God just don't like saying, I tell you what, he can't look on it. Really? If I remember right, when Adam and Eve sinned, who come walking in the garden? Uh, if God is so mad at you when you mess up, how come when Adam and Eve bit of the, uh, the, uh, the tree that he shouldn't, how come he come walking in the garden? Where are you, Adam? And that's what's going on with some of you. God is saying, where are you? What are you doing? And even then, he went and made a sacrifice because he knew there was a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. He went and produced a sacrifice and clothed Adam and Eve in the midst of that. See, we have twisted things so bad that if you sin, you ain't worthy. You a dog. You ain't nothing. You just a has-been. You need to get out of here. And God has said, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. You're not expressing who I am. You're talking about some other God. God's got good things for you. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to increase and not only has he provided the way for you to get it he has provided the power before you to become everything that he's died for you to be yeah. let's look at it right quick look what he says here in John chapter 15 verses uh, starting with verse uh, 4 remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and if you cannot be Fruitful, you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am in the vine, and you are, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me 
and I and them were to produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. How many of y'all go out and do your own and you're still doing a whole bunch of stuff? That ain't what he's meaning. He's saying apart from me, you can't bring the glory to Christ that you need to be. You're out there not sitting and resting in God's goodness. You're out there trying to work to do it to accomplish something. And God says, when you're in me and I'm in you, buddy, apart from me, you can do nothing if you're out there on your own. But keep on, look what he says. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Now, us old Pentecostals, we used to use that to just rake y'all over the coals with. All that saying is, men, when you're out there on your own, it's just futile. Everything you've done, all those works, you might as well take those things and throw them in the fire. And then look what he says. But, everybody say but. If you remain in me, redemption is through him. Faith is through him. Access is through him. Not based upon my works, it's based upon me sitting. But if you'll remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want. And it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. Look what he says here. This brings great glory to my father. The reason why a lot of us are not getting what we're asking for is because we're trying to get it on our own effort. If I can pray enough, I can read enough. If I can praise enough, the glory will come down. There's a spider, let me get him. See, I tried and Kobe stepped in. He's a little faster than I am. That's what happened, a spider ran around. Which one of y'all brought that spider in here? Look at me. When we do and allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us, instead of doing the opposite of what God's Word says, we bring glory to the Father. Y'all hang on with me. Let's keep on going. Number two, he wants us to know according to the Scripture. Look at verse 19 in that same passage. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? Know the exceeding Not just power, exceeding power. Toward us who believe. According to the working of his mighty power. Not only has God provided here for you, you got to learn to sit to receive it. As you learn to sit and rest, you'll begin to watch God turn everything around for your good. I'm telling you, that's what God wants. But if in the back of your mind you think, well, you know, maybe it ain't God's will for me. Maybe, maybe I've sinned too much. You know, maybe I ain't got enough word in me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And you're just sitting there toiling on what you don't got instead of trusting in what God does. When you can learn to begin to trust in the positional truth of the scripture then you are set up to begin to walk out everything that God has done for you it cannot be in your effort and guess what when you begin to do that the exceeding greatness of his power will begin to work in you mightily I know what some of you doing I hadn't seen it I I don't know because I'm telling you just sit sometimes and watch your own effort come out well, when I get my life straight, then I'll serve God. Now, yeah, you know, preacher, when I, you know, and get things straightened up, I'll do it. Look what he says. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. See, it's in Christ, which raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above principalities, powers, might, and dominion. See, that's another problem. You folks have been fighting with the devil too long. He has done win, whipped, and put up. Just don't take his bait when he throws it out in front of you. You see what I'm saying? This is how some of you boys live. I'm telling you right now, you sitting there going through your phone, and all of a sudden something flops up. Oh, it's a woman. It's a naked woman. Oh, Oh my God, oh, I love you. You know what you do? Turn that bad bell off. You got something new and you turn it off and say, that ain't get, that's, that's nothing but playthings. 
That's what we call fornication. It ain't real. It ain't adultery. It's just fornication. It can't happen. It's just the image in your mind. Turn it off. Begin to trust God's ability in you rather than the image that you're seeing. And I said that about men. Some of you girls need to do the exact same thing. I've been coaching girls my whole life. I know what they're doing. Snapchatting. And half of this stuff ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It's got stuff to do with I'm not trusting in the power of God. I'm believing the lie of the world. I want pleasure and I'll get it at any cost. Just remember, pleasure gets you in big trouble. Well, I've seen some folks getting a little bit nervous there. <laughs> Romans 8, 11 says this. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, not based upon your works, but based upon through his spirit who dwells in you. Believe me, there's going to come a point in time, whether you're young or old, there will come a point in time where you recognize all your education. All of that will not accomplish anything. All your education, all your money, all of that, there's going to come a point in time Well, when you stand before God, none of that account. Not that he had a problem with you having, but it ain't going to get you nowhere. You can't pay $1,000 to get yourself held in heaven until somebody gives enough money to get you on further. Concluding here. The truth we we are faced with is this. We were created for him. But because of fear and unbelief, we shy back from his greatness in us. Now, you know I'm speaking the truth there. Half of the marriages are destroyed because somebody's fear to pull to be in a doormat. I know. I fear that regularly. Man, if I do this and do this, what am I going to be doing? Walk around wearing a skirt and cooking supper too now? My Lord, if I keep doing all this, why do I need a woman? I just might as well do it all myself. Wake up in the morning, fry it up in the pan, you know, do all that. You know, the fear of, fear of not being able to trust God to work through these situations in people's life. Fear that if, if, if I do like Jesus did, who was a servant and he was humble and he did these things, what if people take advantage of me? And Jesus says, I got you back. Not only that, I'll give you the ability to keep doing that. And that's hard for me. I'm telling you, I see a bag of trash when I leave, and I got a one job at my house is really to take the trash out because my wife pretty well does everything. I do a sorry job at that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm I, you, know, all, you know, half of them in the back of my truck right now if you walked out there because I couldn't even get them to the trash can at the bottom of the hill. So your pastor is a loser, okay? You think your husband's a loser? No, your pastor's the loser around here. A bag of trash. I mean, man, fill me on that bag of trash there a little bit. Thank you. You're some honest folks here. Let me say it again. The truth is we're faced, we're tr- faced with this. We were created for him, but because of fear and unbelief, we shy back from his greatness in us. When we're doing that, we're just restricting the glory that he deserves. Last scripture. I ah, got one more after this one, but you get it. This is Colossians. This is a whole nother book of the Bible. Paul is trying to get something across to us. Look what he says. For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. A snapshot. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Look at that. Walk it out. Order your behavior. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Look at this. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering 
with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, who has the Father has, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, uh, kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins. He is the image, the photo of the invisible God, the firstborn, what, where, he was the firstborn, we're the future sons of God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created that are in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or principalities. All things were created through him and for him. And he, before, he is before all things and in him all things consist. This thing right here is standing because of the power of God. There are anything else, the power of God working. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, the firstborn from the dead in all things that he may have the preeminence. What is preeminence? First place. Why does God want to be first place in your life? Because your soul. Your soul tricks you regularly. It tricks you. You think you're preserving yourself, but really you're hurting yourself. God said, you let me be first place and I got nothing but good for you. I'm not going to lead you down nowhere that won't bring uh, good at the end of this. God wants to become first in our lives because we have a tendency to do, be, to be destructive when we go at it alone. Right? When we go it out with him being connected, we just kind of mess things up. Ephesians 4, 1 through 4 says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling. This is his original passage. Which, with which you were called, with all, look at he says here, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this is what the Holy Spirit laid on my mind for somebody in here today. In closing, are you tired? Are you worn out? This is Matthew 11. Burned out on religion? Come to me. This is what Jesus said. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythm of grace. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and live lightly. In Jesus' name. Are you tired of religion? Are you burnt out? Have you been out there working on your own? God says, my burden is light. Whatever your view is on Christianity, if it's a burden, then it's not him. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, but before service started, the Lord let me know there's somebody here in that position. You're tired and you're worn out. The religious thing just hadn't been working for you. It's because you started on the wrong foot. You didn't start from a position of rest. You started from a position of walking and you never learned how to rest. But every head bowed and every eye closed.